Hi and welcome to Revoy. My name is Jason Slover. I'm a senior FX artist and instructor with over 20 years of experience in the film and commercials industry. So we decided to put this Houdini beginner's guide together really to help anyone that's interested in learning Houdini and to give them a proper foundation going forward. This content is created as part of a larger course and that's the Houdini Fundamentals. And this can be seen as a warm up for anyone that's brand new to Houdini. It's a little bit on the long side as we've got quite a bit to cover, but it's definitely worth taking the time to watch it. So with that being said, let's get started. Hi, in this video, I just want to cover the different versions of Houdini and the installation. So let's go ahead and jump to sideeffects.com. Uh, and what we can do is go up here to get and click on buy. Now you'll see you presented with a couple of options here. So the first one is our free edition. Uh, this is great if you don't have a budget and you really want to learn Houdini. It's a fully functional version of Houdini. The only limitations is you'll have a watermark and your render size is a little bit smaller, smaller than usual. Uh, the other options is there is no third party plugins allowed to be installed with this and you can't export geometry to be used anywhere else. Moving on to this indie, this is another great option. It's subscription based. Um, you'll find most of your freelance guys use this. And as you can see, it's if you basically making revenue of uh, under 100,000 USD a year, which is a fair amount of money to be making. And you can see here, uh, you've got two options with quite a nice saving if you take a two year rental. And moving on, we've got the artist and studios. These are essentially the same in a way, uh, just a slightly different licensing solution. But within this, there is essentially three options. And the core is a lighter weight version of the effects. Uh, this, as you can see, it says if you doing modeling or lighting or rigging animation, this basically is a good one to use for studios. Uh, as you can see, it's a fair amount cheaper than the actual full blown effects. And it still allows you to bring in tools created by the effects team into this version and be utilized. So it's a great all round little product if you just want to have extra uh, users running Houdini. And then obviously this is your bread and butter Houdini. This is the one you're going to be using if you're an FX artist in a larger studio. Again, different licensing. And then they've got an educational version, and this is really designed for instructors. I would say it's a fully functional version of Edini as well. And um, yeah, basically it's not limited in any way. Uh, it's just the limitation is that you can't use it for any production work, and it's got a slightly different file extension. The engine, this is just a little free install installer that comes that, that's plug in for Unreal or Unity. Quite handy if you're in games development. Okay, let's move on to the installation. So what I'm going to do is go down here. You can click back on buy or download. I'm just going to click on download. And now you can see we are presented with some options. So first one is the recommended way, which is the launcher. This is pretty useful. It's a small lightweight little utility that runs on your desktop and you can basically manage your Houdini licenses and different versions. So say you've got an older version of Houdini running, you can essentially switch between them quite easily and then just run that one. There's an old installer, which we're not going to cover because, well, it says old installer. And yeah, we've got some licensing options, which we've obviously discussed already. What I wanted to point out though, at the bottom here, there's a production build and a daily build. Now these will appear in your launcher as well, but I just want to go over them in this context as well. So your production build, as it says here, is for your day-to-day -day work in a production environment. And these builds are basically put out after a month after ongoing some quality testing. And what happens is, what side effects does is every day they put out a, a new build of Houdini, and this is quite unique to side effects. Um, not many software companies do this that I know of. 
and essentially what what you can do is every day you can download a new version of Houdini um, and that contains bug fixes from the previous day which is quite interesting to sort of keep track and if you've submitted bugs for for example you can go here to the daily build and you can see and it might have been fixed so if I just click on production builds for an example you'll see what comes up here is the current version production builds is 20.0.547 and if I let's just add disable production builds and click daily builds you can see here now it's switched to 20.0.552 and that's the latest daily build so at some point one of these builds will become the production build um, what you can do another interesting thing with side effects is they've got these journals and if you click on this little book icon you can actually go into the Houdini journals or change logs as they call it now and you can see essentially what's happened on a daily basis what they've updated what they've fixed um, sometimes they even throw in little new features that they don't advertise which is really nice so it's quite cool just to every now and then have a look at this journal and and see what's going on okay so i'm going to go ahead and just download this launcher coming up on my downloads of the year it's a fairly quick download and uh, let's just launch that this is a pretty quick install it's like i said it's quite lightweight so i'm just gonna install it while we sitting here and you can see it goes fairly quick so should be done in a sec yep it's done i'm just gonna click finish and then i'm gonna minimize my browser here all right, so you'll see up here, here's your Houdini launcher. Let's just drop it down here. I'm going to open this up. And you can see here I've already got a Houdini 19.5 installed. But what I want to do is I want to install a 20. So I can just click on this install here, Houdini. And it should come up with that production build and the daily build. So for now I'm just going to click on the production build. And this will come up with some preferences. Uh, I'm not going to worry about these plugins. Like I say, these are extra plugins. And if you're running Unreal or Unity doing some game dev, maybe you want to install those and have some additional options so you can do stuff in uh, Houdini related work in those programs. The other thing I want to do was make sure this automatically installs side effects labs is enabled. Uh, this is a really useful tool set. And it's kind of like an experimental tool set that's developed by the, some of the guys that work at side effects. So they're not officially tools built into Houdini, but they are built by the guys from uh, Houdini or side effects. And there's some really useful tools that's come out of this and definitely worth having in your tool set. So we're just going to make sure that's enabled. And now I'm just going to hit install. Okay, while this is installing, I'm just going to pause the recording. Okay, so now that we have Houdini installed, I just want to have a quick look at this launcher. This first section here, we've obviously got our different versions of Houdini. And then the next tab here, we've got our Houdini Engine plugins. We obviously didn't install any, but if you wanted to install, it's no problem. You could just click on that and click on your version. It will open up the installer again and you can just install those plugins. Next we have this HQ and this is Houdini's render farm manager. It's really useful if you've got a spare machine or two lying around. Uh, I would say if you can get it running it's quite nice to do. What it allows you to, to do is run a client and that will allow you to obviously offload rendering onto another machine so you can carry on working on your primary machine and you can also run simulations on a second machine but obviously this is not really necessary uh, if you don't have a new machine or a second machine you don't have to use it and we also won't be covering any installation of this on the fundamentals moving on to the labs this is just the installed labs packages you can install different ones and then some licensing admin so just going back up to the Houdini tab We've got our launcher here, so we can launch specific versions. 
we can also launch them up here and we can change this over here to set it to the default so set it to 19.5 or set it to version 20 as the default i'm going to go ahead and launch it so when you first load up Houdini, it's going to take a little bit of time so what it does is it has to cache some of these icons and when you open up Houdini again it's going to be a lot quicker first thing you'll be presented with is this uh, usage statistics and it's up to you whether you want to take part in it it's just really side effects ways to try and gather some information about what your machine's doing and if it crashes and uh they can that can help them down the line but in my case i generally just say no thanks click ok the next thing that's going to come up is the start year and this is fairly useful for beginners it's basically got a whole bunch of learning paths uh, you can look at these and just open up in the browser it points to Houdini's documentation and it's got some getting started guides and foundations very useful just going to close this down um, but for now I'm just going to disable this I can turn on the turn off the show on startup and hit close as I don't want to load it every time I load Houdini The first, first thing I'd like to do before we get started is I just want to load up a scene file. So I'm going to go to File Open, and I've got a little shortcut here to my Houdini Fundamentals. And you can see here's a week one, so we'll go into that. And there's a week one razor. If you want to add little sh these shortcuts, it's quite useful. Um, let's just go back, save week one if you select it, and you just pre press plus, and then you'll have basically a direct shortcut to that week one and this is really useful if you've got projects in different locations and you're going to switch quickly get to them um, so i'm just going to delete this shortcut go back to my razor so week one razor and i'm just going to load this guy up so i wanted to just have this in the viewport so we could have something visually interesting to look at while we're exploring the interface if you want to actually pan around this guy you can just left click and drag and you can see if you rotate uh, left or right, it will rotate around or orbit around the center point of the origin. And then what you can also do is you can middle mouse and hold down, and then this will basically give you a pan and it moves the object anywhere under your mouse. It will just follow your mouse. And then we've got another option of scrolling in and out with your mouse wheel. This is a zoom. But there's also a better zoom if you right click and that gives you this arrow and you can zoom in and out uh, quite nicely with this option okay then going back to my left click and just orbiting around i'm just going to put it in this nice position here so let's move on to this top menu i'm not really going to go too much into this top menu we'll utilize some of these as we progress through the course but as you can see there's a quite a bit of information in here and you've got your usual things like file open and save and there's a little project set up and we'll be utilizing this in an upcoming video uh, what i really wanted to focus down was a bit further down and there's these these buttons uh, this build one it's actually a drop down so if you click on it you can see it comes up with a whole bunch of stuff animate build games grooming etc and this is actually quite an interesting toolset this allows you to change Houdini's desktops to suit your needs so for instance let's say you were into modeling you could change your desktop here and it would just expose modeling tools so if I do that and just take a note of all these icons at the top if I switch to my modeling you can see everything changes and I've got just if you read all these things they all seem to be based around modeling uh, another good one to look at is your Solaris look dev and we'll be utilizing this at a later stage in the course and this is where we do all our scene assembly and our lighting and shading look dev so I'm just going to switch back to my build desktop the build desktop is your kind of default desktop and this is quite useful when you're just first starting out I know there's a lot of information here but there's at the same time there's a lot of tools that you can click through and get familiar 
with Houdini by utilizing these tools. Other options in the desktops is you can create your own. So once you're a little bit more familiar with Houdini and you start to kind of build up on your own workflows, you can create your own desktop and set up colors and everything how you want to want Houdini to behave. There's also a handy little desktop manager. And if we just expand this, we can see it's got all the objects here. We can do a couple of things like we can duplicate a desktop um, and then you can see I've got a two there I can also just go in and rename it and you'll see now it's renamed the other thing I can do then you obviously is I can hide it I can delete it but I don't want it anymore quite another handy option that I like to use is uh, as you can see there's quite a lot of stuff in here so Further down the line, you might decide, well, you don't really need all these desktops, uh, maybe just a bit of visual clutter. So you can actually go in and hide these desktops you don't want. So uh, for instance, I'm just gonna click on this little H here and you'll see it flashes red as I do that and hit games, grooming, images, labs. I'm just gonna go through a bunch of them and just as an example, uh, show them off. Uh, it was interesting it didn't disappear that one uh, there we go and this one this one don't want that that okay so but if you want to actually see what's hidden you can actually go under options here and there's a show hidden files and this allows you to show this list of hidden ones and you can uncheck them as you go along um, and that's quite cool so if i hit accept now and i go back to the this you can see now i've only got three desktops um, and this is you know super useful just for cleaning up a bit of clutter okay moving on to this next little drop down here this is your radial menus and this essentially just gives you quick access to tools commonly used tools in in the viewport and what you can do is there's some volatile keys you can press for instance, there's V, if you press it and hold it down, you come up with some options. And if I go downwards, you can see the menu changes. And now if I go downwards again, you can see that you can select a certain things. So, and if I go right and left, so if we go up here to wireframe and we enter, this is gonna change our display to uh, wireframe. And if I hit V again and hold it down, and then I go down back again and then I can maybe go to hidden line ghost it's a slightly different viewing option and again we'll go to shading and then go back to our smooth shaded view this is pretty useful just for quick access another one is your uh, C key and we can hold that down yes so by the way you don't have to hold it down you can click it once and let go and it will stay up um, until you've actually made your selection. So for instance, I can go to create your geometry and you can see I've got a bunch of geometries that I can create. And these are kind of like preset built geometries. Yeah, going up here again and up again, you can see these various things. I've got some crowd stuff going out there. Here's effects on this side, a bunch of different effects we can kind of go into and apply. If we look at the pyro, yeah, you've got your your dry ice, your wispy smoke, bully smoke, and if you click and select this, what it will do is it will create like a preset bully smoke simulation setup for you. And this is really handy if you're new to Houdini and you want to know how to lay down nodes and you know really get working quickly. Um, very nice to do. But ultimately, I'm not really going to be focusing on these radial menus there is a tab menu and if you press tab there is a tab menu that comes up here and in the network editor these are so encompass all the tools in Houdini and we'll be using those most of the time as well as some shelf tools uh, these are so quite handy to use down at the bottom here we've got our timeline um, and this is obviously useful if you've got a shot with animation in which is most likely going to be the case or your simulation you know you can check your what the frames are doing and you'll see some information come up here when we're running simulations there's a play button 
which you can stop and you can obviously play in reverse um, and, and you can then skip between if you've got keyframe specific uh, keys you can skip between those you've got some options here that you can load up so if we click on this we've got our global animation options and this is where you can set your frames per second and your frame range etc i'm not going to dive too much into this right now uh, we'll utilize some of these maybe a little bit later i'm just going to close this for now just go back to frame one and then if i look at this little key here this is where we can actually auto key uh, parameters so if we want to do some animation on a parameter we can just globally key it here quite quickly uh, for example if i want to uh, animate this razor upwards what i can do is just click key and then you see all these values change to green and these are my parameters uh, for these for this guy so and I'm on frame one, so if I move to say frame 25 and I go on translate and I want to move it up so I can go to translate in Y and move this to say five units up. And then you'll see it's moving up. But now there's a little orange line here and orange here. That means the value has changed, but it hasn't set a key. So what I can do is I can go here again and I can click on this and you'll see it, everything changes green which means I've set a keyframe there. And now if I scrub backwards and forwards, you can see I'm going, I've got this little animation going. Next to this, yeah, there's a little animation editor. And if I just load this up, that will actually bring up the curves for this animation. And you can see there, there's a line and you can, once we get into a little bit further down the line, we'll start looking at some animation and now we can adjust these curves. Now I'm going to close this. I'm just going to go back to frame one. And what I want to do is delete this animation. So I'm just going to right click on here and say delete channels. Right click on here, delete channels. And right click on this one and delete channels. Moving to the bottom of the screen here, you'll see there's this little brain icon. And this comes into play when we've got simulation data. If I click on it and hold down, You'll see there's a new create new simulation enable so you can disable simulations here and if you have multiple you can switch between those simulations um, to specifically simulate the one you want to run there's also options to reset simulations here and we'll look at that once we actually get to the simulation part of the training next to this we've got quite an interesting one this is our auto update and if you click on it, you can see there's on mouse up and manual. The two ones that we use probably most of the time is just auto update and manual. And this is pretty interesting. So auto update is basically every time I move a parameter or change a parameter that happens immediately. And in Houdini, when you changing parameters, it's called node cooking. So if I've got a bunch of nodes, like chain together and I make a change they will all update um, and we call that like cooks down the chain so essentially what what's going to happen if you've got a really heavy scene and you make a change it's got to cook down the note down the network and sometimes this can take a little bit of time so what we can do in those cases and if you know Houdini and you know what kind of changes you want to make you can set this into manual and now you'll see if I make a change to my parameters, nothing actually happens. Um, this law is kind of staying in the same place. But now if I set it back to auto update, you'll see the razor is going to basically move to a different position. And this is in the position where I, which I've set to, which is 195 units away. Um, so that, yeah, it's quite useful for hit, like I say, heavy scenes and just allowing you to uh, make changes quickly without having to wait for Houdini to cook and then you can update it once you've made all your changes. I'm just gonna set this back to zero and zero. And then on my, while I'm hovering over my viewport, I just wanna press space, uh, H on the, sorry, on H on the keyboard. What I want to move on to next is these three central uh, window panes. And you can see 
there's three of them. So there's these little windows you can maximize the pain and there's a little drop down on the side. And you can see there's one here and there's one over here as well. Um, we can do a couple of things with this whole layout. We can actually adjust it. So if you hover over the center here, you can slide this up and down to move it. Uh, likewise on this one, you can move it up and down to a different position. We can also collapse it upwards or downwards. So if I click on this up arrow, it basically collapses the parameters. And if I click down arrow, it brings them back. And likewise, if I go the other way, I can collapse my network editor and then going this way, bring it back. Uh, we can also swap them around in the center. If you click on the center, there's a little arrow, as you can see. And let's just click on that. And now you can see I've swapped the parameters and the network editor around. Let's just go back and swap this again. And likewise, on this side, we can do the same thing. We can collapse this out and bring it back and we can swap our pains around and bring it back. Yes, so, so just interestingly, there's a little pane here that's actually hidden by default on the side. And this by default here is just representing our context modes. And you can see there's a object level and there is a razor model, which corresponds to what we're seeing here. We'll go a little bit deeper into these uh, context once we get going with Houdini. Let's just collapse this pane again. And I just want to take a closer look at a single one of these panes. And for that, what I want to do is actually just want to maximize this pane. And then I also want to just minimize the shelf tool. And you can do that by clicking up here. There's this little line that basically stows it or collapses it. And you can bring it back by clicking on the line again. So let's just collapse that. Likewise, you can do it at the bottom with a timeline. There's one here as well. Let's just collapse that. So now we've just left with this one window and this, this one pane. And in this pane, you can actually see there's multiple tabs and these are separate windows that's attached to this one pane. And what we can do is add and remove from these and like the shelf tools, we can drag them around and rearrange them as we please. You can click on the little X and go, okay, well, I never want to use this or this. Uh, you can add on the plus, you can add different ones back that you find useful. So for instance, the Python shell, maybe uh, let's just close that. And we could essentially just close all these ones we don't want to use. And then we will just be left with this one. That's the scene view. And like we we're saying earlier with the desktops, what you can do in this case, then if you really want to do, let's just minimize this. So we're back to our setup here. And what you could do is you could just go, okay, well, all I want to see is that in my viewport. And you can essentially save a new desktop. And every time you load up Houdini, you'll basically come to this uh, little streamlined desktop that you've created. Likewise, we can just delete out all these ones that we wouldn't possibly need. Uh, for now, I'm just going to delete everything. And now you can see we just got one view. Uh, you can see there's something's changed here, though. We can't see our razor. And this is because when we were selecting through the tabs, we've actually switched into a different context. And this is a chop context. So what I'm going to do is just go back here and go back to my object level context where we are currently looking. And now you can see my razor is back. The other option, what we can do with this pane, and we can do them to any pane, is we can actually split them. So if you go to this little arrow on each of these arrows, on any of them, you can split them left or right. So let's just do a top and bottom. And now you can see we got another pane. So now we've actually got four panes in our viewport. And you can, like I say, you can adjust these still to however you want. And however you whatever suits your needs and then you can change this up to something else maybe you want to have this as a network editor as well for some reason or oh, and you can add let's say let's just add a tree view here and we can see it now we can have multiple tabs here to do different operations while we've still got our viewport open another handy uh, way to work with this is you could actually tear them off 
So if you select this arrow key, and then you can say tear off pane, and this basically takes it to a floating window. Now this becomes quite useful if you've got say two monitors, and what you can do is you can, for instance, you can maximize this guy up quite large. Uh, sometimes these networks get quite big and busy, so the more real estate you've got, the better. So you can, like I say, maximize it, put it on your second monitor, and then on your current monitor, you could, for instance, just collapse the all the other information and just have your viewport on the one and then your network editor on your other monitor. And this just gives you a lot of real estate to see what you're doing. I'm just gonna go ahead and close this because we don't want it. And then for some reason, I'm just gonna close this error. For some reason, if you mess up your desktop and you don't really know what you've done uh, and you don't know how to revert, so there's something going wrong. What you can as a do in this case is you go back to your desktops here and you can do a reload current desktop and this will refer to the current desktop you on that's saved onto disk. So if I reload current desktop, it's gonna take me back to that build desktop and now you can see I've restored all these panels here, all these little windows and my razor is back to where it should be. For this next part, I just want to start exploring this little toolbox down the side here. Uh, to do this properly, what I really want to do first is I want to create some additional pieces of geometry and this is just going to help us explore these options a little bit better. And there's a couple of ways we can do this. So first of all, you can go to the shelf tool and on your create tab here, there's a box and sphere and torus, etc. So I'm just going to click on the box. And now if I come and hover over my viewport, you'll see there's a little wireframe of a box displayed. And what I can do is just click anywhere in the viewport and it will be placed at that location that I've had my mouse at. If you go over here now, you'll see in my network editor, there's a box one. And under this geometry box one, there is some value set and this is set to these coordinates. So if I move it around, you'll see that one will change. Uh, let's just create another piece of geometry again and let's just use a sphere this time and I'm going to place it this side for instance. Click and enter. Now you see where I've got my sphere here. Uh, just as a note that it's highlighted in yellow once I've got it selected and this is also highlighted in yellow. And if I go back to my razor, let's just hit the select tool and I select my razor. You'll see there's a yellow line around it. And the same in my network editor, there's a little yellow line around it. And you can see I've got the razor model up here as my parameter set. Another way to create geometry is there's actually another two or three ways. Uh, what we can also do is let's just go to this tube, for instance. If I again select my tube, you can see this little kind of bounding box comes up. But instead of pressing on my left mouse button, what I can do is press enter on the keyboard. And what happens is this places this this uh, tube now, tube one's placed down, but it's placed it at my origin. And the origin is the zero coordinates in my world space. So you can see there's a, a zoom into this, there's five units there. And if I move this away, just offset to, to five units. You can see I've got roughly five units there, but there's a zero, zero, zero sitting here. So if this is on zero, 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 that's where my current sphere is. Oh, sorry, my tube is sitting. Another alternative option to dropping a piece of geometry is if you hold down control and you select, say this torus, that will automatically just place it there. You don't have to bother with moving your mouse around or anything like that. So that's just a really another quick way of dropping geometry. And I'll move this off and let's just drop a tube again. And there's another tube that's popped up. So I have got a tube there, Taurus, another tube. And as I cycle through these, you see I'm selecting them all. Okay, then moving up to this area here. So this is my object selections. And currently I'm in what we call object mode. And we can confirm this by this little object icon here on this menu. 
and then it says objects here in this network editor as well and i can just basically go down to my select tool and select objects as i'd like to do you can also unlock this so uh, um, it just makes it easier to select tools um, whenever you want sometimes the lock tool doesn't allow you to change selection especially if you're in a different mode this next level is components, and we're not going to cover this right now, but this is basically if you want to dive down into geometry and start modifying it and you want to select, say, your points or your primitives. That will get to moving a little bit further down. So now we've got some a move handle, a rotate handle, and a scale handle, and these basically do what they say. So if I have, for instance, let's just select the eraser, and you can see now I've got these three axes and this is my Z axis and my Y is green and X is red and these are always represented up here as well in the same colors so you can see this is X here, Y in green and Z in blue and this applies to my rotate and scale as well. So if I move this in X you can see on the parameter it's up here this moves this object in X only and then if I move it in Z you can see I'm moving in Z now I've got these two values that's set according to that there's also this in the center here there's a, a dual axis control so you can set, you can move along say X and Z if you're in this zone and if you hold down that and move and now you'll see if you look at the parameter editor I'm just moving in those two axes uh, likewise I can go onto my Y and my X and if I hover over this you see it says X and Y and now if I move that you'll see now I'm moving on my X and Y axis in the parameters there. Next moving on we've got a option here for some rotation so we can just rotate again on one axis um, and then we can rotate on Z as well You'll see once though, once you've rotated or slightly around one axis and you start rotating, then all your axes move. And this is essentially what just how rotation works in, in 3DU, kind of offsetting it in a world space rotation. Another option you can do while you're rotating is you can actually hold down control key. And if I say move on my X axis, you'll see as I scroll up, there's a 45 degree increment that you can rotate to and this is really handy if you want precision work and angles another option you can do if you want to slowly rotate so if i click and drag this and rotate you can see it moves quite fast i can actually hold down shift on the keyboard and now you can see if you try this you'll be rotating at a lot slower pace okay so and then we've got, yeah, further down, we've got a scale. This is obviously you can scale in each axis, which is often not what you want to do. But in the center, you can actually scale uniformly. So if you click on the center one, you can uniform scale up and down. And this is probably your better option if you're scaling models up and down. Right, so let's say we've selected this and we've done our transforms and you see you've got all these values and you're not really happy with it and you want to go back to where you started what you can obviously do is you can go into each of these and you can set them to zero 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 but that's or scale is actually one sorry but this is kind of tedious and you don't really want to do that so there's another option and on this translate you'll see you can right click on this and it will give you a menu now towards the bottom of the menu is a revert to defaults and if you click that you'll see these values get set to zero. And if I right click on this again, rotate, revert to defaults, and that will be set to zero. Again, on this one, you can do the same thing, but there's just a, a shortcut to do it. And the shortcut is if we hold down control and middle mouse button, that reverts to defaults as well. Likewise, if I select one of these guys that was placed over here, you can see this value is actually in bold and that means it's changed from the defaults 
So if I have middle mouse and control on this, it will default to the origin, which is the default settings for this node. Moving a little bit down, there's a pose tool here. We're not gonna cover this. This is basically for rigging and manipulating rigs. Down here, you'll see there's a, another handle and this is a transformer handle, essentially the same as your uh, translate and rotate, but it combines the two and you'll see if you select my, I'll select my move tool, you'll see just these handles. If I select the transform, you'll see there's the move handles and the rotate at the same time. And this is just quite handy. So you can move and rotate without switching up here or switching on the um, keyboard to different modes. And we can rotate around and select this little red thing and freely rotate in any direction we want. It's quite useful. This is actually on the keyboard is a, a Y um, shortcut and that switches between different modes of this handle. So you've got your scale. If you hit Y again, then it just switches to transform and then your transform and um, rotate at the same time. Let's just hit Y again, Y again, so we can cycle through those. And then again, if we're not too happy with these transforms, maybe we're happy with the um, rotation, but not the scale. So we'll just uh, middle mouse uh, control on this one and hit the scale back to normal. And let's just make the translate back to zero. And now we can see we've got our little cube sitting back at its default value, but our rotation is still set how we want it. Down here, we've got some tools for uh, grid snapping. And if we're in different contexts, we can actually snap to either polygons or points uh, and there's a multi scatter or multi uh, snapping option as well. So I just enable the grid snapping and I move this box around. You'll see these, these little highlighted boxes that pop up and that's where the grids are. So it's basically snapping to the grid points. Again, this is really useful for precision work. Uh, it's going to disable that again. Move this out the way. Going down, yeah, we've got our camera view again, which we have explored. So selecting that goes into our camera view, which is the same as escape on the keyboard. And then you can, what you can do if you wanna go into this handle mode again, you can just press enter on the keyboard and it will come up with the last object you've selected. So if I select this object and I press escape on the keyboard to go to camera mode. And then if I hit enter again, it's gonna come up and select this guy that's already selected in the network editor. I'll select the eraser, um, let's do some transforms and I hit escape and now let's uh, left middle or left mouse and pan around a bit, middle mouse to sort of move it along and then we can hit enter again and now we come up with our handles again and we can move it into a different position as if we want. And likewise, we can again, do our middle mouse button and control and we can reset these values to zero. Further down, there's a little render region tool. We're not gonna use that for now, but that essentially draws a little area in your screen and you can look at a little a render preview of what you've setting up once if you've got lighting and, and cameras in this context. Uh, further down, we've got a little object inspector. Uh, this is fairly useful, but in this context, it's not going to help us much. And perhaps we'll look at this at a, at a later stage. Going right down to the bottom, this is a useful tool. And this is actually for flipbooking. And flipping, flipbooking is where you essentially capture your viewport, but you can capture it as an animation. Uh, so you want to preview some uh, rigid body simulations you've done or some smoke you've done and you can just do a preview of it in the viewport without actually doing a render. Uh, so what happens, you can hold down your mouse button here and it will come up with a flipbook with new settings. And if you hover over that and click OK, you'll see there's a bunch of options that come up and 
we'll be exploring this a little later on when we start doing some uh, simulations and we want to flip book those. Then further down, there's a little icon here, and this is like a film reel. This was actually for rendering, but it's kind of a legacy tool set, and we won't be exploring this in our current training session. Moving on to this side panel over here, essentially we've got a couple of options, and a lot of these will come into play further down the line when we start manipulating geometry and attributes. But at the top here, we've got our grid display. You can turn on and off. There's a construction plane, which you can set. And this is if you're doing modeling, it's a little bit more useful. There's a lock. We can actually lock the viewport to a camera or light. And we'll look at that later on. And then there's some kind of viewport OpenGL shading modes. Uh, the top one is no shaded. And you can see that makes the geometry totally flat. And then there's the default one. These other ones are only useful if you've got some lights in your scene and you can do a slightly higher quality lighting setup and get a preview of what your geometry might look like in a rendering context. Uh, over here is a material option. So this is if you've got materials applied, you'll get a again a OpenGL representation of that that material on your object. Uh, then we've got some options further on for displaying things. And this is a whole bunch of things. And for instance, you can hide if you've got cameras in your scene and, and lights, you can hide those. And you can even hide geometry. So if I select this, you'll see now I've got no geometry visible in my scene. And if I click the sunglasses again and toggle this geometry, now my geometry is back. It's just basically hiding it from you from the viewer so you don't select it accidentally and then going down you are these the points display points display normals uh, display point trails uh, point numbers these are all really going to come into play when we start uh, modeling and utilizing Houdini's uh, procedural workflow and checking how the data flows through objects a little bit further on we've got some Again, information to show us how our polygons are looking, if we've got UVs on, and then just yeah, some various other options that's available to us. We've also got going right down here, we can display a background image. And this is useful if we're working on, for instance, a live action movie, and we need to match the lighting to a specific plate, or let's say an explosion has to match the size of the explosion that's been filmed, we can sort of view an image in the background and get an idea of what it's supposed to look like. And yeah, some just visualizers, these we'll look at once we start getting into Dean as well. Next, I just want to have a look at the parameters up here uh, that's associated with your geometry. Uh, starting off on the transform panel, we've obviously manipulated some of these already and we can see that the values change over here on the parameters and we can reset those to default uh, by just entering the default. What you'll notice as well once we change something that that value becomes bold as well as the top tab here becomes bold so if I switch away you can see there's something that's bold here and you'll know that there has been a change made to the node in this tab. If I set this back to zero and to zero, you can see nothing's bold anymore. Another useful way to transform instead of using the handles or entering values here, like you could do, we could actually use what's called a little ladder. And if you middle mouse over any one of these, you can adjust this with a ladder. And this gives you incremental adjustments. So you can go either in increments of 1 or 0 0.1 or 10 and if I just slide this left or right you can see I'm incrementing in those values while I'm holding down my middle mouse button and if I go down to 0 0.01 you can see it moves even slower if I go up to 10 and then slide back and forth you can see now I'm incrementing units of 10 and this is really nice to quickly adjust stuff or slowly adjust stuff if you need to you can also adjust all these parameters at once 
uh, with the same method. So instead of on an individual one, you can do it to all. So your middle mouse on your translate and you get that ladder back again and you can actually now start transforming and it will transform all the accesses at once. I'm just going to reset this to default by hitting uh, control and middle mouse button. Another little handy quick tool, and this is, works at object level. If you click on year, you'll see this says uh, select an object to match the transform with. And say I like this little torus over here. Once I've selected that, I can click on this torus, and you'll see now my razor jumps to that position, which is sitting at just over 12 units in space. Um, and we can confirm that by actually selecting the torus over here, torus one, and you can see the units are exactly the same as if I select the razor. Let's just set this back to zero quickly. Uh, another option just to look at uh, once we, when we're looking at say rotating or transforming an object around in a scene, this is actually, you can see this uh, manipulator is sitting at the origin and that's where the obviously where the ships come in but we can set this uh, pivot is what they call to a different location and when we rotate and move it will rotate around that location and this is this pivot transform so what i can do is say i want to move the uh, pivot uh, in z up to the front here let's just go along z axis and i'll use my ladder and we can move it in the positive value and let's say okay we've got now a value of nine we've got now pivot sitting over there so now if i rotate my razor it's going to rotate around that location uh, likewise if i move move doesn't really display much but rotation gives you an idea of what it's doing and then if i set my pivot back to the zero default location then i'll rotate around that angle again as well. Next I want to move on to the all-important network editor. Uh, I'm just going to expand this and to give myself a little bit more space. Um, as you can see I can just click on an object to select it and obviously gives me that yellow line around. I can drag and select objects, multiple objects at once. Um, for now what I want to do and I want to recreate some of these default pieces of geometry but i want to show you how you can do it in the network editor so i'm going to drag over all of these and hit delete on my keyboard and now those guys have all been deleted so what i can do now in the network tab is i can hit the tab key on your keyboard and you'll see there is tons of stuff that comes up here if you hit all you can see there's just lists and lists of uh, tools you can actually drop and utilize but what we can do is there's a type search so we can actually start typing say box and you'll see a box will come up as we start typing that and if you hit enter once you've got that and then it will come up with this little node floating around and then if you click anywhere in the tab you'll see it will drop and now we've dropped box one and that will drop it at the default origin uh, location again if we do tab again and this time we type sphere uh, we can see sphere comes up there's two different variations this is essentially the same thing internally they just set to different parameters so we'll just have sphere polygons for now and now we can see we've got our sphere and we can if we press enter on our viewports and we can invoke that transform handle and let's just move this out so we can see it's not under the razor. Uh, let's hit escape again to do the camera mode. Okay, moving back to the network editor, uh, we've got a couple of options of things we can do here. I can, for instance, drag these around by selecting them and holding down the left mouse button I can do the same if I select all of them, it will move all of them at once. There's quite a nice little feature, or if I select one or multiple, I can make these a little bit neater uh, by lining them up. If you select, like I say, select them all, 
and you hold down A on the keyboard, uh, it will come up with this little box. And if I select one of these and drag down, you'll see they all line up. Likewise, if I select them and I drag to the left or the right, say, sorry, then they will all move in a line this way. Again, we go move down, they move down. And if I go to the left, they'll all go to the left. Okay, I'm just going to rearrange these into a vertical setup. Okay, so what I want to do now is I just want to look at the display options. So we can turn the display off in the viewport uh, and we can do the same. We can select everything and turn the display off for everything at the same time. Over on this side, we've got a selectable option and this is not for the network editor, but for the viewport. So if I disable the selection, you can see if I go to the viewport and into my selection mode, I can't select the razor at all, but I can select the other objects that are in the scene. And then if I just enable this again, now I can select the razor. And this is just to ensure that you don't accidentally select something and move it if you don't want it to be moved. Uh, very useful. We've also got a lot of information uh, panel that pops up here if you click on it. Uh, and this will be a lot more useful in the geometry context when we get to that. It will give us a lot more information to work with. You can go ahead and click anywhere or appear to close it. Another option to view that is to actually just middle mouse on you. And as soon as you let go of your middle mouse, it will disappear again. The so middle mouse on that one and on this one. And you can see, for instance, on this where I've got a translate and on the translate it's actually given me some uh, transform information that's coming up here and it tells me exactly where it is in world space other things we can do in this uh, network node is we can actually connect these nodes so if i click and drag on on this little button here down and drag to the bottom it will actually connect these two together and you can see this is when it connected it said parent there and in this specific context which which we're in object level we're actually using a parenting technique here so these are actually now connected so if i move now for instance and i go into my transform press by pressing enter on the keyboard and if i translate up you'll see my um box and everything is moving together. If I translate my sphere, which is snapped to that same location as the box, or it, if I move that sphere around, you can see it sitting inside there. It's transforming the box as well. And then if I transform the box, that transforms separate. Uh, likewise, if I rotate the sphere now, select it and rotate it, you'll see that the box rotates with the sphere but not the razor. And this is kind of like a hierarchy parenting system. Um, likewise, if I do rotation on the razor, you'll see everything will rotate and translate together. Now, this is only really useful if you're doing parenting. There used to be a rigging context in Houdini. Well, there still is. And this is where you do kind of build up bones and you can almost imagine if these are bones and they were connected you can connect them together so it's still quite useful to use if you want to just move things all around together but in general you don't use it quite that often so i'm just going to go ahead and delete these connections and reset everything so what you can do is you can select on a node on this line sorry and then you can press delete on the keyboard uh, another option is there's a little cut tool and that's Y on the keyboard. So if I press Y and hold, you'll see a little scissors comes. And then I click and drag, I can drag across this line and it will disconnect. Uh, just going to select the razor. I'm gonna middle mouse control and basically set these guys to default. This where I'm just gonna reset to default as well, as well as the box. 
and now everything's by default and disconnected from each other again. Okay, so let's just have a look at some of the other options available to us. You see, as I'm hovering over here, you can see there's this little pop-up that comes up. And this is related directly to these display and selectable buttons here. Uh, what these are do, they're called node rings, and they're super useful if you, say, zoom out on a large network. And what you can do to zoom out is if you scroll mouse button and basically zoom out quite far, you can see I can no longer see those little display flags and they might be quite hard to select and to do various operations with. So I can, for instance, if I hover out over here and this comes up, I can turn off my display and you can see I'm turning off the display in the viewport. Again, let's just zoom in and you'll see that that's, I can select it over here as well. This is the main selection. This is kind of useful when you're further out in a larger network. We can also then make the object not selectable and this is only for the viewport. So if I've got my box selected, say, and I go to the viewport and I go to my selection mode and now if I try and select the eraser, I won't be able to select it because this node has been disabled from a selection point of view. Let's just enable this back again. Now it's worth noting that these, if you go into a different context, these layouts might change and you will see different behaviors that you can apply to different objects and different nodes. Uh, on this one, you can have an information panel. You can pop this up by clicking over here and this will give you some basic information about the node. And for instance, if I have uh, let's just go onto the sphere by selecting it and maybe I'll translate it outwards by uh, 12 units. And then if I press information on it, you can see it's got some transform information that's come up and it will give me exact those exact values in the list here. To get this information, another option is to just middle mouse over the node. Uh, hold down your middle mouse button and then that information will pop up and as soon as you let go your middle mouse that information will disappear again. Another option I'd like to show you is the connecting nodes. And just to be aware, we are in object level and we you can see that by looking at this text here. Now in object level, when you connect nodes, it behaves differently to other parts of Houdini. So for now, let's just connect two nodes and see how those are connected. You can click on one of these buttons, whether it's the top button or the bottom button, but let's say just click on the top one. And if I just go around, you can see it's creating a line and I can just snap it to there. And you can see what it's saying, it's saying parent. And this is essentially parenting my box to my razor model. So now if I move, if I go into my viewport, press enter to get the transform handle, and if I move my razor, you can see that little box is actually moving with the razor. So this is quite useful if you've got a large scene with a, a lot of uh, specific objects in that's laid out in perhaps a certain order and you want to move them all at once. There's actually a, a handy little locator or it's called a null. So if I tab and type null, okay, this pops up and you can see there's this little null in the viewport, the screen object. Let's zoom right in here. Um, basically like crosshairs. And this is a non-rendable object, so it will never show up in your renders. But what you can do then is use this as a control to connect objects to. So I can connect, uh, say, my razor model to my null. And I can also, just if I just click on this in the middle, and hold down and drag, I can actually change where this line is linked to. So I can drag up here and put, drop it onto this and let go of my mouse. And now you can see my box is connected to this null as well. I can also then connect over here. I can click and drag up or I can click on it and let go and then click on this one and they connect it as well. 
So now if I move this null around, select this null, you can see it's got my transforms and everything. And when I move this around and rotate, you can see everything in my scene will be moving according to this null. What's quite interesting to note then obviously is you still have control to move your objects that's below this connection. Um, just again, quite useful if you want to refine stuff. I'm going to go ahead and delete this and just show you another quick example of this parenting. So let's just drag over these lines and we hit delete on the keyboard. Another option to delete lines is if you press Y on the keyboard and hold it down, it comes up with this little scissors and you can just drag through your line and that will delete that connection as well. I'm going to go right ahead and just delete this swear out and this box out. And I want to set my razor back to zero coordinates. And let's make this defaults as well, this little null. So I'm going to middle mouse and control and set them to zero, zero, zero. And let's go ahead and connect this guy by dragging down on it. And now I want to duplicate this razor model. So let's just zoom out here and give ourselves a little bit more space. So what I can do now is I can do a control copy, uh, which is control C on the keyboard, and then I can control V to paste it. And this basically gives me a copy um, of that model. A quicker way to do this copy and pasting is if I hold down Alt on the keyboard, and then I click and drag on the model or oh, on the node actually, and then I can place this and, and, and as soon as I let go, of my mouse button, it will make a copy and then you can release Alt as well. So let's just do that. I want to move this guy out. Let's just move this guy out. And then my next copy, I want to move this a little bit further out and we can just then let's connect these guys up and see what actually happens. So I'm going to connect this guy, the razor one to this razor model. And then I'm going to connect this razor to this razor model and you can see something weird happened there. Now what happens is it tries to inherit the position of this previous model. So if I disconnect it, you'll see this position shows up again. So what I can do in this case, there is a keep position when parenting and this will keep this object in this location when I parent the two together. So now if I click on this line and connect them up, um, sorry, I needed to, let's just do that again. Now, if I click on this position when parenting, this should stay in the same position when I parent these two. So now let's drag this line and connect the two. And as you can see now, I've got my razor sitting in the same place still, and they are all connected. Now you can imagine this as a hierarchy of parenting. So almost imagine this is an arm, for instance. Uh, let's just say this is our shoulder and what I can do is I can rotate the shoulder and you'll see that everything moves along with it. Likewise, if I imagine that maybe down this one, this is maybe my elbow, I can rotate this and you'll see everything underneath here will rotate, but not above it. So this one didn't rotate, the bottom one rotates. And then I can move this around and rotate it. And then if I rotate this one again, imagining this is the hand, this can move on its own without affecting anything underneath. Again, so if I go up to the top and move my shoulder, for instance, everything else is moving relative to that position. And then I can go in and kind of tweak positions and mess around like that's quite a quite a handy trick to utilize things and be able to transform them together. Okay, so I'm just going to go out and delete these additional razor models. I'm just going to uh, click and drag over them and then hit delete on the keyboard. And then I'm going to select my null and hit delete on the keyboard. Now I'm just left with my original razor in the scene sitting at origin. I am going to Space, press space and H on here to home it. 
and let's just deselect it over here by clicking in an open space. What we can do now is just maybe rotate it down to a nice position. So it's just nice to look at. And now I just want to explore some of these other options up here. Uh, for that, let's just create some additional stuff. So I'm going to hit tab again, and I'm going to type box, bring up the box, and then I'm going to maybe this time create a Taurus, so we can type Taurus over here, and it'll come up Taurus. Another one that popped up there you could see was a test geometry, so let's create a test geometry as well. Uh, let's try test, and you can see it comes up with test, and maybe we want rubber toy, and we can just go to and find that, or we can actually continue typing, and we could type rubber toy, even if it's one word, it's still Houdini still finds it. Uh, by the way, if you just go hit backspace and clear it out this typing, I could uh, find that rubber toy by even just typing rubber toy. You don't have to uh, type that start of the node's name. You can type anywhere that's got the node's name in. So if I just type, uh, for instance, toy, that will come up as well. So it's quite useful that you can uh, type words that you that's part of the actual node only. I'm just going to click and drag and drop this so we can see what it is. And let's just move this guy outwards here. Maybe we'll scale him up a bit so he's a little bit bigger and looks a little bit better next to the razor. And I'm just going to move my torus out. Let's scale this to and then let's move my box. Okay, so now we've got a couple of objects in the scene and in our network editor. What we can do now, just for visual purposes, we can change colors on these and we can also change the shape of these nodes. Now this becomes quite useful in, again, in larger scenes. And if you've got a lot of the same object, you might want to uh, display them in the same way. And so what we can do up here, there is a little color palette chart. You can click on it and it will open up this little swatches here. And if you select one of these nodes, you can give it any color you want. Uh, same as the Taurus, let's make it a different color. And then Tommy, sorry, the rubber toy. We just want to make that a different color. Let's give him a nice, yeah, a different color to what he is. So what I wanted to show you here is if you're coloring it here, it's not actually coloring it in the viewport. This is just making the nodes a different color. Just something to take note of. The other option, what we can do is we can hide this little palette again. And next to it, we've got this little shape palette. Again, quite useful. We can select a node and then click on one of these and it will change the shape of the node. So we can change our torus to a circle. Maybe we will change the razor to an X. And then the little toy we can, well, I don't know, let's give it a random shape. Let's try this one. Yeah, that's not too bad. All right, so now you see we've got some different shapes going on for each object. And this, like I say, is useful if you zoom out and perhaps you've got a, a bunch of the same objects. So, so let's say I've got a bunch of these Taurus and if I, again, um, hold on Alt key and click and drag with my left mouse, I can make a copy and paste and let's do it again. So now I've got three of the same objects. They're the same color, same shape. So I can visually see quite quickly that these nodes are the same and I can actually click and drag and select them all. Maybe I want to change them all at the same time. You can do that. Moving a little bit over to this side, we've got some, uh, we've got a create network box. And what this allows us to do is to put a bunch of elements into a box. And let's do that. So if I drag and select around these guys, you see now they're all selected. And I click on, click on my network box. You'll see now I've got this little network box that pops up. What this actually allows you to do is if you click and drag on it, you can actually move all those nodes within that box around. And this is just moving them around in the in the node editor. They're not actually being affected yet at all. And you can actually collapse this little network box. And then you can see you've got a lot more space to work with if you're working with a big scene.
working with other objects. And then only when you need to come back to this section, you can expand it again, and you've got all your nodes available to you. The other thing you can do with this is you can also change the color and give this a, any kind of color you want if you want it to stand out. And yeah, like I say, you can actually you can actually double click on the ear and you can give it a title if you want. So then that becomes like a group of objects with a specific title. Again, going on to the side here, we've got some sticky notes. And really this is a looks similar to this, but it doesn't behave the same. So if I drag a node in here and I move the sticky note, it doesn't move the nodes around that's inside it. And uh, so this is just really adding nodes to your scene. So we can type anything. And we've got some text going on here and you can type a whole bunch of stuff and just leave notes for perhaps you've got a big scene that you're sharing with somebody in a production environment and you wanna just explain what each node is doing or which nodes they need to work on first before moving on to the next. And, or just leave some notes for yourself for future reference if you might wanna open up an old scene and you've got some notes, you don't have to try and remember what you had done before. You've, you've got some handy uh, group notes here you can look at. Again, you can expand and contract this and you can change the color to whatever you want. And yeah, so if we contract that, then it's a little bit more compact and quite useful, especially if you've got quite a bit of text in here, then it will just give the top bit of text. Um, another option, what you can do is you can actually change the size of this text. So if you want it large, it changes the whole thing. So this is quite useful. You can almost make titles and in here and so kind of forces people to look at it. Okay, moving uh, on to the side here, we've got uh, create images. I'm actually going to be using this in an upcoming video, so we'll explore a lot then. And then we've got this little subnet option, option here, and this is, you would think, similar to the network box, because what it does is it creates, it puts everything into almost this little box. You can see it's a box icon, but it behaves quite differently. So. If I just, for instance, I wanna just select all these guys together and I wanna make a copy of them. So you can do that with multiple nodes as well. So I'm just gonna hold down Alt and left click drag over to the side. And now I've got a duplicate of all these nodes at the same time. Uh, keeping them all selected, I'm gonna hit this create subnet. And now you can see they've disappeared into a node. And what's quite different about this is if I drag this around this title that's network box you can see um, you can't really do anything with it but if I select this node I can actually move this node and it will move everything that's inside this node you can see there's a transform handle here a rotate um, and this is just another way to contain a bunch of objects and have a lot more control over them. In future uh, tutorials, we might look at building a, what we call Houdini digital assets. And this is where this comes into play and you create an asset that is transportable and other users can use it so that you can just load this up and it will contain a bunch of nodes inside. To look at what's inside this node, you can just select it and press enter on your keyboard and you can see we're still at object level essentially but it's got a subnet attached here so if you look here it says object level subnet one and that's the name of that and if i click on this object level again it's going to take me back outwards and you'll see it there it's your subnet one again and you can obviously name this whatever you want the last little thing i just want to look at here is the find node Again, this is really useful for large scenes. And if you've got a whole bunch of stuff and you quickly want to find a node, you can just type here. So if I type, start typing Taurus, you'll see there comes up with Taurus. And if I click on Taurus, 
that actually zooms into the network in that area. So if again, if I go, I want to find the razor model, which is there, but if I click on that razor, it's going to center the razor to my network editor here for me. And then I can, so I'll quickly be able to find anything I want. Um, I can do subnet one, and it will do the same thing. Okay, now that we've explored some of the options in the network editor at object level, I wanted to go into a different context and let's look at some of the differences that will come up as far as the node behavior and how they're displayed. So first of all, before we do that, I've reset my Razor Senior um, just by opening it again. But what I wanna do is I wanna create another box object and let's just move this over a bit. I'm going to rotate the scene around. And then I want to create something different. So let's do a test geometry. And you can see there's a bunch of test geometries. These are quite useful for testing and prototyping setups, like effects work. And they're just a little bit more fun to work with when it comes to viewing things rather than just trying to test something on a box or a sphere. So I'm just going to select this rubber toy for now, drop him down here. Let's move him outwards as well. And I'm going to scale him up so he looks a little bit better next to our razor. Okay, zooming in a bit. Next, I just want to pay attention to these nodes. So if you look at them, they've all got the same icons. They all say geometry up here, geometry. If you select one and you can view it up here, it says geometry. With a name, likewise on this one and this one, it's all the same. The only difference is this actual name, and you can click on this name and rename it to whatever you want. So for this, I'm just going to delete the test geometry and the one, and just click away from it. And now we can see it's called Rubber Toy, a slightly cleaner name. And then going to a box, now I want to go into this geometry or one of these. And for the first one, I want to use this box as the example. So if I select it, there's two ways I can go in. I can double click on it, or once I've got it selected, I can press enter on the keyboard, which is what I'm going to do. And now you can see my other, uh, my other nodes have disappeared, and this has changed to geometry. And now I'm in the geometry context. And you can see up here, there's an OBJ, which is my object level and my box one, which is what I'm currently in. But now the first thing you'll notice there is a box one here as well. And there's some changes, but there's still a size rotate and a scale. Now, obviously, now this is confusing because you clearly going to be asking me, well, why is there a box in a box? So let's go up and explain this. I'm just going to go up back to my object level, and I can do this by clicking on this obj or i can click on this back arrow i'm going to click on this obj icon once i click it i'm back here and i can see my other objects my other nodes and here's my box one again so when it comes to creating these boxes uh, either off the shelf tool or using the tab these are actually little presets that gets dropped for you so let's just have a look so i when i drop this down it's creating this container, this geometry container. And inside this geometry container, it's creating the box geometry. This is the actual geometry. If I go back up, hitting this OEJ, this is actually just a container that holds that piece of geometry, that box geometry. And then what's happening when you set it up, Houdini's Naming, naming it for you in a naming this container for you in a logical manner. And I could name this to whatever name I want. So let's go out and delete that. And we can prove that it's just a preset of sorts by hitting tab and let's type geometry. And when geometry comes up, we can click on that and then click again. And now it creates this geo one. And you can see it's the same looking set up uh, up here you can see it says geometry and now if i give it a name for instance calling it my con 
container. And now you can see that it says geometry as well. And if I select it or double click on it to enter it, now I've entered into the geometry level, my container, and you can see there's nothing in it. It says empty network. So from here, of course, we can start creating our own geometry. And let's, for this example, do our box again. So I'm going to hit tab and type box. And then I just want to create a, a torus. Is that a good example? And let's just have a look. So now you're noticing a couple of things here. And what I want to point out first is this ghosting. And this might be a little bit confusing. Uh, what's actually happening is this ghosting is all your objects in your scene and you can see them but you can't actually select them and they just ghosted so you have a visual representation of where everything is you can change this by going up here next to your um, the way you view your polygons you can go here and select your visibility so you can choose to show them which essentially just shows them instead of having them ghosted but you still can't select them. They're still only living in this object level and you can't select them when you're in this network at geometry level. The better way to probably do it and, and explain it is if I go to this menu again and go hide other objects. Now if I see my box, I can only see my box. And if I click on this object level again and I go out, now I can see all my objects. So if I go back into my container by selecting it and pressing enter, now we can see the box. But now there's another thing here. We've got two objects here and we can only see one. Well, in the geometry context, you can only have one output. And this is because this is where we build geometry or modify geometry. It's not a place where we put a bunch of containers down and have different pieces of geometry. So essentially what you want to do, if you want to see the torus, you can view it here and then now you'll see the torus and my box has disappeared. We can combine them into one and this basically ends, it, ends up creating one piece of geometry and we can hit tab and type merge and this will in a way merge them. We can drag and select on this button down into this uh, long line here and you'll see both those connections are now connected to this. And if I hit my display flag up here, you'll see now I've got the two objects and they're sitting on top of each other. I can go to my torus selected and that's with the transform handle, I can move it off a bit. And now we've got these basically two objects in our container in different positions. And if I go back to this object level, click on here, you'll see now I've got, if I select this, both those objects be selected as ones. And that's because they're not really two objects, it's one object in this container. And then I can move this container around if I want to transport it somewhere. But I don't really want to do that currently. So I'm just going to reset it. But that's just to show you what you can do there. For now, I'm just going to hide the razor and this box and and rubber toy and I'm going to go select my container again and then I'm going to dive back inside by double clicking in it. Okay with the selected let's have a look at some of these viewing options you can see now if I zoom in on my network using the scroll wheel you can see I've got a couple of extra things uh, compared to the object level node. I've got my display which is the same as it was and then there's some other stuff so Let's start off by looking at the second one. Now this is a template flag, and this is useful if you've got a large network and you want to see something else within the same network, but just as a wireframe, and you can go say to this torus and you can click on this template flag and you'll see it come up as a little wireframe. And this is might be useful if you wanna you know, roughly position something close to it or or just check the scale or, or see what it's looking like uh, at some point in your network. Going on to the next part, we've got a bypass here. 
and this basically just able, disables the node. So if I click my view back to my merge and I enable my bypass and now the geometry is back, the torus is back and now the torus is disabled. The same way you could do that with on the merge, you could disable the merge and now you'll see if I, let's just remove this template from this by clicking on it again and now we no longer see that wireframe. Now we've got this merge that's working together and uh, let's just enable it again and you can see these two solid lines, if I select them you can see the two lines that are blue coming into this merge. If I disable it you'll see my torus disappears. Now this merge node is being deactivated and you can see now this line becomes dotted, meaning that the input, the second input to this merge is no longer active because you're not actually using the merge, you're actually only looking at this stream, this first stream that's coming in of data. I'm just gonna enable this again and then moving on, we've got this information panel again. And now you can see if I look at the information, there's a lot more going on than what was up at object level. We've got point counts and perimeters and vertices, and there's some other information happening down here. We'll get a, a lot more into this further on down in the course when we start manipulating geometry. But for now, what I wanted to show you is what you can do is you can actually just pin this as well uh, just to compare some data here quickly. If I select my box and uh, get info on it, you can see the box only has eight points and six primitives. And as soon as I plug this merge in, which is connected with this torus, now on this merge, is, I've got 296 points. And what's happening is this, these pieces of geometry are being combined into one. And if I press info on this, you'll see now I've got 288 points on my torus. And then if you add the box, you get 296 points in total. So these geometries are now merged into one. It's going to close off the information panels here. The last little visualizer I want to look at in this is this little lock node. Um, comes up on you as well. You can actually lock your node and this is useful but also can be quite dangerous at times. Uh, just keeping in mind that sometimes you your scene could crash and you could lose some information. So what's happening when you lock it is it's storing any information that's above this node. So this box and this torus that's coming into this merge, it's basically caching it into this node so and then saving it into your Houdini file. So if I save my Houdini file, this node will have all this information in that's above it. So what I can actually do now is I can delete these guys. So if I drag and select both of them and I delete them, you can still see I've got my box and my torus there. And because this is one piece of geometry and it's locked into the viewport, or locked, or locked into the scene rather, this uh, is containing all that information within it. Now, like I say, it can be dangerous because if I unlock this, it's going to lose any information that was coming as an input. So let's just try that out. So I'm going to unlock it and it's going to give me a warning. So let's click OK. And now you see I've lost any data that was coming into this merge. Okay, so I'm just going to delete this merge and start with a, a new setup here. So let's, uh, example type Taurus. Now we've got our little Taurus in our network here. And what can we do? So let's just connect some nodes and see how they connect. So there's two ways you can connect nodes, obviously. We've explored, so let's just add something and I want to maybe add some uh, noise to this torus uh, to make the geometry less uniform so we can type a mountain and can drop this down here and you can see if i try and view it it's going to give me an error and it's got your required geometry to add uh, noise to and then i can just yeah, 
obviously cl click up and drag select them so they're connected I can select this again line or I can use the Y key to scissors delete the connection alternatively another way to drop this is I can let's just delete this quickly I can click on this little button node if I click on it and let go you can see I've got this line that's just not really doing much but now if I hit tab and I type mountain and I click on the mountain and then you'll see it's automatically connected for me in that way and now in order to view it I just need to change my viewer to view the mountain and as you can see parameter wise there's a whole bunch of stuff and this is this, what it's doing is just giving me a bunch of noise patterns and I can change various options on this and we'll be looking to a lot of these kind of nodes in a, a lot more detail when, they, when we get into our geometry uh, lessons. The other thing we can do with these nodes uh, quite handy is we can put little dots in between them and if I hold down alt on the keyboard and I press in the middle here somewhere and it will create a little dot and now if I release my alt key I can move this dot around and this is kind of just useful to split off data uh, in different ways and neaten up your network if you've got a large network so let's for instance drop a color node and I drop it down here and let's just connect it to when I hover over it comes up the dots and the top dot is to connect something to the top and the bottom is to connect something to this so I'm just going to drag and select that and now I've got essentially two data streams being split out and I can view this color if I change the color to say maybe something green and then I can view this mountain on this side uh, likewise you could I mean we don't really have to if I take the dot out I can just select it and press delete on the keyboard you can see now I'm still splitting out the streams but in a less sort of uh, cleaner way it's a little bit more noisy I can also just obviously delete those connections by doing the old scissors with the Y key and I can maybe let's rather connect the mountain to the color and connect this input and now we see that error disappears and now my torus has some noise on and it has a color we can just neaten this up again by selecting them and pressing A on the keyboard and swiping upwards and now they're all nicely in a line the other things you can do here then if we look again at this bypass we can bypass the mountain and you can see I'm still retaining the color on my torus and this bypass is deactivating that noise for us another way to just change your display flags is you can actually hold down R on the keyboard and if you hover over a mouse and you click on it you'll see it changes the display flag to that specific node so you can see there's a little flag coming up on my under my cursor there and if I just click on a mouse while holding down the R key it changes the display now you'll see there's a purple inset here and this is to change certain behaviors um, and let's for instance hit T on the keyboard and I press this button you'll see now I've got two different displays and this comes into play more when we're rendering um, what happens is this is actually this purple is a render flag and this one is a display flag so a good example of this would be if you want to uh, render out this torus but only with the mountain and in your viewport you actually only want to display the color so you don't actually want to render this color you maybe want to render it with a different color and Maybe another example is if we drop another color node and by the way there's a little history that comes up of recent nodes you've used and recently I used a color so I can just go here and click on it and I can hit the color here and let's just connect this color to here and view it. So you can see my render flag is still there but let's make this red for instance and now I've, on this side I've got my green torus. Let's close this color panel. Here's my orange one. 
So now I can display this color, my green one, but what I can do is I've a T on the keyboard and click on the display flag here. This will now, if I had to render, it would render this um, orange, this torus as orange torus. Uh, this is quite useful just for uh, visualizing large pieces of geometry in your viewport, but you don't really want them to render as you're viewing them. Uh, another option I just wanted to show you as far as arranging networks go is you can actually hold down shift on your keyboard and if I move this node you'll see everything above it move so if I hit this color node and I hold down shift everything above it moves uh, likewise if I maybe select this mountain and if I hit control everything below it will move so if now if I just try and move this torus up by itself. Oh, sorry, just do that again. So if I just move this torus around by itself, you can see it moves on its own. If I hold down control, the whole network moves. This is similar to selecting everything and moving it, but it's just, I guess, in a slightly more convenient way. What you saw briefly that just now was that I disconnected the nodes, and this is another handy tool what you can do is Houdini's got a shake function, and if you shake the node quite quickly, it basically disconnects them from this network, and you can see now it's totally standing on its own. And then what I can do to bring a node back in if it's loose into a network, I can just drag it over these wires, and you'll see it will highlight, and now if I let go of the mouse, it's now back connected to that. And again, we can just shake it loose, and now it's on its own, and then we can bring it back into the stream by just dropping it over here, and you see it's connected. Now you can see these lines as well. There's an option to change the line style. So there's, if you hold down Shift and S on the keyboard, you've got two kind of line styles that you can change to, and this is just really preference of how you want to work. Uh, you might prefer this, this style or, or more traditional style. Okay, I just wanted to finish off this lesson by showing one or two little extra tools that are available in this network as far as connecting nodes. Uh, another option is what we have is a switch. And if we hit tab and type switch, we've got a little switcher here. And what we can do here is if I view this object that's orange or this one that's green, with the mountain in, one doesn't have the mountain. We can connect them again to the switch. Now, instead of having to go and drag each one, so you've got multiple ones, and let's actually add a few more just as an example. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select both of these, and I'm going to alt drag here and connect them, or we'll sorry, drop it. And you'll see now I've got a mountain here with the color again, and it's still connected to the torus. I can do it again and then and maybe let's just change some values here quick so let's view this and i'm going to view this color so here we've got a green let's maybe make this this color by selecting it and on the parameter we can make it yellow and then let's just move to this one that's green it's still green because i copied it from this original one and we'll make this blue for instance and let's just, uh, just maybe on this one change the the element size and the scale of the mountain. So now I've got all these guys, a whole bunch of them, and I want to connect them with either a merge or a switcher. Uh, these are different behaviors and I'll show them now. You can obviously select them and like I say, you can drag each one in. And this is kind of going to be a bit tedious if you've got a whole bunch of nodes. So let's just take our little scissors and cut through this. What you can do is you can actually drag and select all these nodes with them all selected. You can click this little button icon and you'll see now I've got all the nodes creating lines to this and I can just drop them into the top of the switch. Now the switch node is exactly what it does. If I view the switch node and I select it, you can see I've got a solid line here and some dotted lines on this side. And this is indicating to me that I'm switching between 
these incoming objects. So at the moment it's set to zero, which is your first input. And this is this orange Taurus here. So if I select this and I go to my switch and I toggle to one, you'll see now this switches here and this becomes a solid line. And now this one, these ones are dotted. And now I've got my green Taurus. And if I carry on, now I've got my yellow one and then my blue one. And that changes like that. If we go over to this side to the merge, like we said before, this merges everything into one piece of geometry. Obviously, in this case, it's not entirely ideal. But as an example, we can just select them all again. And I can click and drag down into the merge node. And these will merge all these together. And you can see all these lines are solid. And that means they're all just combining it into one piece of geometry which isn't, as you can see, entirely useful in the scenario because they're all overlapping. All right, in the next uh, week's lesson, what we're going to be doing is exploring the geometry context and we're going to start with our actual building and seeing how we actually build geometry step by step using some procedural workflows and, and manual editing of the geometry. Great, see you next time. Hi, in this video I just want to cover context in Houdini and let's just have a look how they fit in to the rest of the workflow. Okay, so if you go to the object level here, or even here, you can see there's a couple of contexts here and we've obviously been working at object level while setting up and looking at the user interface and we've touched briefly on geometry level, so, but there is a couple more. So the first one up here is your channel operators, and this is often referred to as chops. And then you've got your image, and this is your composite operator, and this is referred to as cops. And then your material builder, or your VEX shader builder, is for materials. And then we've got object here again, and then your output, this is typically for uh, render management and uh, geometry management, especially if you're using a render farm. And then we got shops. This is kind of a older setup. We won't be covering this, but it's essentially been replaced by material networks. And then we've got our stage, a slightly newer context into Houdini. And this is where our USD fits in. And we will be doing shading and lighting in this context. Lastly is your tasks, and this is your tops, or your task operators. And this is really cool for automating tasks and doing quick setups and batching processes. Another quick way to have a look at those lists is there's a, this little tree icon here. You can click on it, and you'll see the list here um, with all the ones. There is one missing from this list, however including this and that's our dynamic operators we i don't know why the dynamic operators aren't yeah that's essentially your dops um but what i wanted to have a look at here was actually with this tree view is if you click on this first one you can see these actually just come up almost as folders and that's a way another way you can look at this structure in houdini it's a directory based system with a bunch of folders that you can open up and you can add data into those folders. So for instance, if we go back, double click in our object, you can see in our object here. And if I drop a network, uh, let's just use this, one of these test geometries, I'm just gonna drop this guy. And if I go into that, you can see I'm object over here, object level test geometry. And it's obviously opened up. I've got some other stuff in the scene at the moment, but you can see it down here. What you can do is you can actually right click on this and go edit pathless text. And that gives you that idea of okay, I'm in forward slash OJ forward slash test geometry. And I can just go back like this and I can go to different ones. For instance, the copnet, and I can just press enter and it will dive right in there. And this is really how you can navigate Houdini in another way. Uh, but I just want to really show you that that's kind of a 
almost like this directory structure with folders. I'm just going to right click on it again and say edit path graphically. It's obviously just a cleaner way of looking at it. Um, and now if I go into my test geometry again, you see this that path. I'm just going to go ahead and close this guy and I'm going to delete this dude. What I've done is I've prepared a little scene and I've got some setups here. So over here I've got some geometry. We've briefly touched in geometry. The first context I want to look at is the chop network. But for, before I dive into this, I wanted to actually show you a quick example of how this can be used and what it might be used for. So I'm just going to go ahead and do another test geometry and I'm going to drop the old pig head again. So we've got this guy in here. And then what I want to do is I want to just do some animation, up and down animation on it. And I'm just going to simply do this by clicking on this key. I've got the geometry selected, clicking on this key, and you'll see these values all in green. And on my Y axis, I just want to animate it up. So I'm going to scrub my timeline to frame 24, and then I'm going to just lift it up with my ladder up to the SA, that's all right. And you'll see it goes orange. There's a little orange thing there indicating there's a change. If I click on it again, it will go green. So now I've actually got a keyframe. So now if I go backwards and forwards, you can see it goes up and then I'm just going to go to 48 and let's just bring it down again. And hit a key again and then for fun we'll just make it go up a little bit more again and hit another key. So now you can see I've got this animation. And if I actually click on this little icon at the bottom here, the animation editor, you'll see as the animation editor comes up with the curve that we've just animated and you can see it's represented in green, same as the axis here is green. And I've got this smooth little curve. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. And then what I want to do is I want to add some chops motion to this. And what chops does is it can modify um, curves or you know, animation curves. So we can right click on this animated value that we have here and we can go to motion effects and you'll see we've got a couple of options here. So there's a couple of different things you can do, cycle, spike, lag, limit, noise, smooth, spring, some really interesting stuff. Let's just have a look at the noise, for instance. I'm just going to click on this, and this is going to generate some stuff for me. So it's basically bringing up a standalone panel, and it's created a network. So if I actually just quickly go to the object level here, and you can see there's created a chop net called motion effects and you can see the name up here so it's object level motion effects and then it's also created an emotion effects view and there's actually a motion effects view up here as well but this is just combined it into one panel that's split into two just to give us that convenience and now if i play my animation you can see now it's jittering and you can see this wave form now has got all these spikes in and if i reduce the amplitude of the noise to zero we can see we've got our smooth animation and we can sort of dial that in and up and then you've got your other settings but like your period will change the frequency so we can have a higher frequency noise maybe a little bit less amplitude and if we play it's kind of jittering up and down and this is actually quite useful for various things. I mean, you could add, for instance, camera shake to a camera with this kind of noise. And or one of the other options, you've got like the spring, you could do animated jiggle of jelly or maybe animated tail. And that's kind of jiggling around as you're moving. So really useful tool to, to have in your arsenal. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and close this. And I want to show you another really cool example. Close this. I'm going to delete this network we've just created and this pig head. And then I want to enable this little pig head that I've got here that says chops. 
And that's his, this is linked to this chop network. I'm going to dive in here and go to the top. So what I've actually done here, I click on this file, I'm actually loading in an MP3. So we can actually view audio samples with this. So this is really cool. So if I go to my motion effects view up here, you can see now I've got this, I'm just going to disable that. You can see I've got this waveform that you would see in typical um, programs that you would see audio waveforms in, editing programs and such. And then I'm doing a couple of things. Uh, main thing, I suppose, at first I would be this file if I model mouse to check the information or just on the info. You see there's two channels and this basically representing my stereo channel and I only want to use one channel so I'm just deleting out one say for middle mouse on this you'll see there's only one channel here and then I'm doing a couple of things to resample see resample it and limit it if I view the bottom of the chain now and these guys view together so this whatever you're viewing stays on so that's what's quite interesting as so the chops you can view multiple things at once but you can see the green one now is the one I just enabled and that's after my processes. You can see it's a much sim simpler kind of curve, the, a lot of the higher frequency stuff out and it's just limiting the amount of data that I want to send out to, um, to my geometry network. And now what I'm doing with this is I'm actually modifying my geometry in a way. So on this export node, you can see this my channel, I'm targeting that one channel that we've got. But then I've got this node network and this is pointing to an attribute randomize and the parameter on that randomize is the maximum value. To get here, you could just click on this, but I'm just gonna go back via the network here on the object. I'm gonna click on the object and then I'm gonna go into the pighead chops I just want to go back to my scene view up here. So now we've got a little pighead, view him. And then I've got this attribute randomized and this is actually been where I'm overriding the value on with chops. So you can see this value is in orange and if I click on this max value once, you can see it says overridden by object level uh, chop net one export one channel naught and channel naught obviously rep represents that single channel we created and you can see there's a value if i um, just <clears throat> scrub up and down you can see that value is changing and i'm changing that value based off the audio sample and then what i can do is something like this is i've got a little poly extrude and that's actually i'm extruding each face but i'm doing it randomly at different lengths and I'm controlling it with this attribute called scale. And we'll get into the attributes and how we create them and, and how to utilize them a lot better uh, in, in one of the next lessons. But now if I scroll backwards and forwards, you can see I've got this motion, which it doesn't really help as much. You can't really hear anything or anything. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna go onto my little speaker icon here on the um, bottom here and click on that and then actually I've set up if I go to real time I've loaded in that mp3 here as well now you can see on my timeline I've got this audio waves come in as well I'm going to close this and then I'm just going to hit play you can see now we modifying this jump tree based off an audio sample it's really cool uh, further down i've just got some colors i'm just changing the color based off of the extrusion so just to give it a bit more interest there we go you got like this little audio visualizer and you can imagine the amount of things you could do with this and if you have different kinds of audio or it's just yeah the sky's the limit it's just such a powerful tool to to play around with and yeah i would encourage you just to mess around with it it's so much fun to create these little things okay moving on to the next setup let's just go back to a frame here i'm just gonna 
go back to object level. The next context I want to look at is our dot network, and this is our dynamic operators. So I'm just going to disable this or turn off the view for this chop network big idea. And let's just have a look in the stop network. I'm just going to go to first frame and let, yeah, let's just dive in. So double click on the top net one. And this is, you can see dynamics. So I've got a little pre-built setup here that I wanted to show off. But first of all, you can obviously have multiple dynamic systems in here. So your flip solver is your, your flip, flip fluids. And this is kind of where you're going to be doing your large scale simulations of rivers and waterfalls, etc. You can also do small scale, like if you wanted to do uh, like droplets and crowns and stuff like that, but it's really good for large scale stuff. Your pyro solver, this is your uh, smoke and fire and explosions. This is going to be a nice one that we're going to be using a lot. And then your pop solver, this is actually where you do particle simulations and we, you've got a bunch of nodes you're connecting to all of these to, to make them work. But don't worry about that now, we'll get to that. And then yeah, your bullet rigid body solver, and this is where you do your destruction of buildings collapsing or blowing up bridges and you know, you're fracturing large pieces of geometry and making things crumble and stuff. It's really nice for that and it's fast. And then your Vellum solver, this is a really cool solver. This is a more of an all-purpose solver. Uh, we'd be doing a lot of cloth with this solver. You can do um, soft bodies, uh, you can do grains, your sand and stuff like that. You can also do fluids. It's got a, a newer fluid system that's built in that's quite cool as well. And then, yeah, there's hair. You can do hair simulations with this. So you're, if you're doing hair sims or, or fur sims, you're, that will be running through the Vellum solver. So this is a good multi-purpose multi solver. It's based of position-based dynamics. Okay, so just moving on to the little example I wanted to show. Okay, so moving over to this side, I've got a little uh, cloth, well, not a cloth setup, a soft body setup. And in this, I'm just showing off some of how Vellum works. Um, pretty basic setup, but I've enabled a little extra tool here just to show how you can utilize multiple contexts. So I'm just going to click on this art node, and I've got my little big head again. And I've hit play now on this little tab here on the button, and you'll see yeah, I've got this little soft body guy. And you can see the timeline is going blue. And what this means is the simulation has been cached into the timeline. So if I go scrub forwards and backwards, you can see it's cached. And it will, just as I scrub forward, it will cache frames. This is quite a lightweight simulation, so it's going really fast. And you see it's got quite an interesting little jiggle and looks pretty cool. But what I wanted to do was actually add the chop the chops to this so we can go if i go to back to my object level and i go to my chop network again and then obviously i've got set up this next export here so this export if i change the flag so here it says export and i click on that export i'm now exporting this mp3 we sampled mp3 to a different network so i go to my pig adopts I'm just going to click on the arrow here this time. And now I'm going to go into this Pighead Dops, which is a geometry level Dops. And if I go object level, you can see there's Pighead Dops. And I'm just going to double click to go back on it. So in here, I've got my Pighead. And then I've got a little Vellum setup. And this is basically a preset setup, but it allows you to do soft bodies. So you've got a cloth, which is for your heart to thing. And then this got this vellum struts, which you can see these little spikes if I zoom in and press W on the keyboard to go into wireframe mode. You can see there's a whole bunch of stuff inside. And this is trying to keep the pigot from collapsing. If I disable this, then the pigot will just behave like cloth, but now it's 
this is allowed to create it like a, a soft body type feel. I'm just going to hit W on the keyboard again, and this will go back into my smooth shaded wire. And then what I'm doing over here, you see I've got this attribute here, uh, scale again, it's called the same. And this one's been now been overridden by that value, the same values. And then if I go back to my adopt networks, I'm just going to go to object level. And then I'm going to go into my adopt net one. And then enable this little adjust stress length. So what I'm doing is I'm taking those, what they call struts, that gives the uh, soft body, it holds its shape. I'm actually adjusting that based off my um, MP3. So now if I hit play, you can see now I've got this little effectively dancing pig. And let's just go back to my audio and enable this, uh, do this. Now we hit play and you can see we've got this little guy has been simulated and dancing up and down to this little beat, quite cool. Play it again. Cool, so you can see, I mean, that that's like really a simple setup, but you can see how we're using effectively in this example, we're using three networks. Going up here, we're using our geometry network to create values. And then we're doing dynamics, dynamic operators, and we're driving the dynamics using a chop network. So you can see all these guys start playing together quite nicely. Okay, the next context I want to look at here is the COP2 net one. And this is my compositing operator on my image network. So I'm going to double click to dive inside that. Let's give it a second. Okay, so we've switched to that now. So you'll see now it says compositing up here. And if I zoom in, I've got some images, single frame images that I've loaded in with some stuff. So what we can do here now is just go up the, to the top and we go to composite view to switch that on. on. And let's just view this first guy. So what I'm doing is I'm doing just a basic composite here with a low res render that I did for this test just to show you that you can do compositing in or in Houdini as well. And what I'm doing here is I've got my, just the main shot, the flat render, and then I rendered a explosion separately. So I've got two explosions and then I can composite them over each other. So you'll see now they combine. If I bypass the composite, you'll see the, well, in this case, it doesn't actually, Oh, there it goes, it takes some time, so there we go, bypassing. And then on this side, I've got a little operation with the color correct. And as you can see, this these mountains look like they're right on us. So what I've just done is I've, I've rendered out a depth channel and the depth channel looks like this, just foot range it a little bit. And it's like a gradient from front to back and gives you quite a, a, a values and you can adjust values accordingly. So on this, Color correct, yeah, I'm actually using that as a mask. And you can see now my mountains are flattened out and I'm kind of just cheating, creating like, like a depth haze and fog. So if I bypass that now, you can see it looks flat and all well, these mountains look really flat now, but you'll see once I add a sky over it, this is just a pre-malt. Then I'm just taking a flat color and I'm just compositing my mountains over that. So you can see they kind of like feel like they're falling off into the distance now. If I disable this, you'll see the image feels very flat and now it feels like there's a lot more depth in the image. And so this is just a really basic uh, composite. You can do a whole lot more, but I just wanted to show you that this is kind of what you would use compositing for on the compositing network. There's some other options you can utilize in here, um, but we can get to those at some other point. Next context we're going to look at is our lopnet, and this is our Solaris. 
So I'm going to double click to go in that. And to do this, what I want to do is I actually want to switch my desktop and I'm going to switch to using Houdini 20. You will have a Solaris look dev and this is a newer desktop. If you've got Houdini 19, 19.5, it will just say Solaris and it will look slightly different. I'll just click on this and you'll see if I've changed quite a lot and what it's actually done now is it's jumped out by default to the stage, which is not where we want to be. So I'm going to go back to my object level and then I'm going to double click on this Lopnet 1 to go inside that. So now I'm object level Lopnet 1 and now you'll see I've got some information in there. I'm going to zoom out my right mouse and then pan around to my left so the controls are exactly the same as per object level. But you'll see, yeah, the nodes are a little bit different and there's some additional information here. So this is where we'll be doing shading and lighting. So I've set up an example, just some shaders using this little animated period that we did. So I've got my grid I'm bringing in and then that little pig head. And then I'm just applying some shaders to it. Uh, there's a material builder inside this. There's actually a, if, you, if I dive inside and I dive inside this as well, there's a material inside this. So this is a karma material. And inside here, I'm actually using a material X a standard surface shader. So let's just go out to object level or not object level, sorry, to LotNet. And I'm going to click on this one. And then I've got just a comma physical sky, and then I'm assigning that material. You have to, once you've created the material, you have to assign it to the pig head. So, and you'll see there's a hierarchy here as well on this side. Um, this is just the USD way of working. So you'll see there's a grid and mesh one, and you can rename these as it, as it suits you. But this is, I've just left the structure as default. And now what you can do is you can switch to, on this perspective, you can switch to Karma CPU. And this will start rendering and you can see I've got a light with a bit of a shader on this guy. He's changed his look a little bit. Or you can switch to Karma XPU, which is the GPU based. And this is a lot faster once it starts resolving. So you can see now when I rotate around, it's got some nice detail and it resolves quite quickly. And then if I go to this karma physical sky, for instance, I can change the exposure of the light and I can change the amplitude of the light. So you'll see the lights becoming more toppy. The shadows are now right at underneath the pig head. And he's quite bright from the top or I can make him get quite low and more into a, a dusk or dawn kind of look and you'll see I get these long nice long shadows and the, the sky is actually starting to go a little bit more yellow and then you can also just rotate this around so you can see the shadow rotating around and it's getting a little bit more shadowy on the side yeah, and that's a really cool so it's like so nice to be able to use the XPU uh, now, especially with 20, it's a lot faster and gives us so much flexibility to, to light quickly and, and do shaders quickly. And that's the all I'm going to show for the Solaris context for now. Uh, let's jump back up to object level. And the last one we're going to look at today is the top net. I'm going to jump back to the build desktop first, though. So let's just click on build. And on my composite view, I'm just going to go to scene view again, just for clarity. And then let's just dive inside this top net to see what's going on here. So top net is a slightly different workflow. The nodes obviously all look the same. They have the same kind of thing. But for instance, what I'm doing in this reference, what I wanted to show you is I'm actually loading in some of those renders. And I'm using this file pattern, which allows me to load stuff off disk. But what I've got here, you can see this path and 
Don't worry about this dollar hip, we'll discuss that later. But you can see I've got a renders and then I've got the star.exr. And if I click on this to open that folder, you can see I've actually got the exr, jpeg, exr, and a jpeg, and they kind of named the same and the same frame number and stuff. But the one's exr, one's a jpeg. So I don't want it to load in the jpegs. I just want to load in the EXRs, but I want to load in all the EXRs that's in here. So you could have a hundred EXRs or even more in this one folder. So I can just go star.exr, so it's just loading in everything with the .exr extension in. I'm just going to close this out. And then what you can do is if you right click on this node, you can click on generate node. And now you'll see this it says two year and there's little two things and you can click on them and if you actually middle mouse on one of them to get the information you can actually see now it's found that file that's given me an extension there's the file name and if i click on the next one and middle mouse on that one you can see there's main shot six so it's found the other exr so i've got two exr's and then just moving on to this as the simple sort of task, what I wanted to do is I actually wanted to create an overlay. And this is quite useful if you're doing a lot of simulation stuff and you want to do reference things later on and you don't always remember the settings. So you could come here and you could do a overlay text and then you can write out your frames that you've simulated with some text on top of it. Uh, and this will just give you an idea of what you've done. Maybe, you know, like two or three weeks down the line or a month down the line, you can go, oh, this, this simulation looked good. What were the settings? And you can actually have the settings overlaid on that image. And this is quite a simple sort of preset setup. So on this one, I've just said this file is called, and I'm using this at file name, and this is just an expression and if I go back to this info and I click on it, you can see this. it says file name here. So that at file name is just calling this file underscore explosion underscore v1. So it's using that as the name. So it will say this file name is called um, FX Explosions. And then what I'm doing is I'm running this little composite network. I'm just outputting a lower resolution and then I'm calling the file name output the same thing so that's all if I middle mouse on this output picture you can see it says the main shot version 6 but it, instead now it's using the jpeg extension it's going to write out with instead of the exr and now if I come and I right click on this and I say cook node I have to save my scene to be able to do this. So let's save and continue. And now you see I've got this little green icons and I've got a little tick that says, okay, it's done. And there's two and two. So if I click on one of these, you can see there's actually a connection. So this is connected directly to that. And if I had a hundred tasks in here, you would be able to do that to all of them, click on them. And if I Go down here and middle mouse on this one, you'll see now I've got a bunch more information. And I've got the uh, there's an input, and you'll see here's my EXR, and my output is the JPEG. And let's have a look at if I double click on one of these just to keep this uh, window open. And if I click on here, let's give it a second, and now it's opened up that file with uh, Houdini's image viewer which is called mplay. And you can see indeed I've got this image and with the overlay text with the file name in. And we can do the same to the other one, just to check. Go back to my image view and there's my explosions with the overlay on as well. That's quite useful, like I say, for doing um, batch processing you can do a lot more things with this but this this is a really a good example and a quick example of something you can utilize it for all right that's all i wanted to cover in the context for now
we'll dive into one or two more of these contexts a little bit deeper as we progress through the course. All right, thanks, bye. Hi, in this video I wanted to cover Houdini's node-based approach to procedural workflows. I thought this would be a great opportunity just to show off some of the procedural setups that we'll be covering throughout the fundamentals course. But before we dive into that, what I want to do is just run you through what I mean by procedural workflows and let's just create a really simple setup and to see how nodes are connected together. I'm going to dive into this geometry and don't worry, you don't have to follow along with this. This is just for demo purposes. And I'm going to start creating some stuff. So I want to create a grid. And we have our grid here. And then I want to perhaps give it a bit of noise. So, and we can use a mountain for this. And you can see I've got a bit of a mountain going. Let's increase the amplitude a bit. And essentially what's happening here with the Dini is I've connected these two nodes and it's following the chain down. And this is actually manipulating the point data that's coming into Dini. So if I click on this button, it will show me the points. And you can pretty much see if I adjust the amplitude, the points are moving up and down and all the geometry, the primitives that are connected in between are moving along with those points. So that's essentially what we're doing is we're modifying the point data. Now, what if I wanted to say, just modify only some of this to be in the mountain? Or we could insert another node in between. And for this, I'm gonna use a mask. Um, let's try this mask from target. And I'm gonna click this in here and select this. And then I'm gonna just change one or two things. So I'm just gonna change the type to a plane and I'm going to press enter on the keyboard here. And I also want to turn on this little visualizer and this gives me a visualizer of this mask. And you can see now I've got this mask that I can move up and down and I can change the radius. There's a bit of a ramp so I can soften that out a bit. And now I've effectively added another piece of data to this. And this data, this mask data is living on all these points. And I'll show this at some other point, but if you look at when I middle mouse on here to get information, you'll see there's two point attributes here, and then one's a mask and one's position. And when I've got a mountain, I'm modifying the position. But now what I can do is I can go in this setup and I can go to this blend on this mask and I can set my mask, to, my um, blend to use an attribute and I'm going to use that mask attribute that I created. And now you can see I'm only masking or only creating noise where that mask is. So if I move this mask around, I'm essentially just creating noise in that. And what's procedural about this is that this, this could propagate anyway. So I can change my grid size and you can see Still got the same, same set of noise happening just on the fall off. And I could also go ahead and say, well, this is quite a, not a very nice looking noisy grid. So let's just up the grid samples. And I've got a lot more points in my grid. And maybe we'll just reduce the amplitude of this noise, to make it a little bit better. And we can maybe adjust it outwards. So now we've got this noise that has been, you know, it falls off to nothing based off this mask. And like I say, we can adjust all these parameters, but we could go a step further. So let's just uh, move to another little section that I wanted to show. And I'm, for that, I'm just going to reduce the, the point count on this grid a little bit. And then what I want to do is I wanted to do a copy to points. And this essentially is saying what it's saying. I'm going to copy objects to these points. So I'm going to plug my mountain in over here, and then I'm going to create an object that I want to copy. So let's start out with the trusty old torus. And I'm going to plug this in and plug this in. And you'll see now on that grid, I've got all this torus. I want to scale it down. So I'm going to do transform. 
and let's scale it down. And maybe we should rotate it around a bit 90 degrees so it's flat on the grid. And you can see now, if I just remove this point display, you can see my points, my, my toruses are all copied along that grid and they distorted here. So we can merge these together to see what they look like. And let's just do that quickly and display that output. So now I've got my grid that's distorted and I can go back at any time and I can change any of these values. And my little toruses get updated automatically. And then I can go obviously further and perhaps put a little box down and I can, instead of using torus, I can add a box to it. And so on, let's uh, create another example and let's do a tube, for example. Let's just do a tube, cap ends, and let's add that in. So now we've got three objects, but we could go even further with this. So what we can do is I can merge these guys and I'm going to use a specific merge node here. And I'm going to plug these guys in together and plug this in here. But now you see, okay, well, that's not really useful because I've got all three of those objects in here. But like I say, we, can, we are modifying point data that's coming through this node. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little setup here, which allows me to copy each one of these individually onto these points so you don't get them all piled up like this and for that i'm going to do a attribute create and this is creating data on the points i'm going to just set it to integer that's what it requires and i'm going to call this var or short for variation and in here i just want to call the PT number, the point numbers. So well, this is a handy little expression. You can go PT num. And then I want to do a modulus function on this. And this essentially what it's doing is just going every point that starts at zero, we'll start at zero and go zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, because we always start at point zero. Uh, let's see if we can visualize this guy. I'm going to click on my var and I'm going to go into my display settings here and just change the way we view this setup here. So instead of using a type, I'm going to use a marker and then I've got, you see, it comes up with some text. So let's just zoom into that and we can actually see I've got a value that's between 0, 1, 2 and it goes 0, 1, 2. 0, 1, 2, all the way along here. And if I actually go up to this one and let's just view my actual point count, which is you can do here. And you see I've got point count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. Just goes up in rows. And then when I do my little variation, I've got these three points. And then what I can do now is go back to my copy of points and on this piece attributes, I can use that point data that we created and that point data was created, it was called var. And I'm going to use it here called var. And now you can see I've got my points. I'm just going to turn off the displays and view the output. And let's just make some color here so we can visualize it a little bit better and drop the color, make it a bit darker. And let's give these other guys some color as well. Let's make it a bit of a yellow. And my Taurus, I'm going to make greenish color. And let's just make this a bluish color. There we go. So now I've got I can scale them up and down. I can go right back to the beginning of my setup on my first, very first node and I can modify the input. In fact, what I could probably even do is I could add a torus here. And if it's big enough, let's scale it up. Oops, sorry. 
and we'll scale it up. And now you can see on all those points, I've got my exact same setup and I've got my noise here that I can move up and down. I just exaggerated a bit here with the amplitude and maybe add a few more points just for fun. And then, yeah, let's just drop it down. Maybe, maybe make the element size a bit bigger so it's not so, there we go. I think that's quite interesting. And then, yes, let's just move that mask around and we can see we're affecting the geometry underneath and as well as all those copy to points with the bar retaining the orientations and all the scale and the positions on that surface. And with this setup, yeah, hopefully you get a get the idea of what, what's going on and how we sort of just the data flows and kind of give you a basic idea. Let's just move on to some examples, like I say, of what we're going to be creating throughout the course. And I'm just going to go back to my object level and let's just hide this. And then I'm going to go to my main building and I'm going to go in here. I've got this whole building that we will be modeling. Uh, some of it's procedural, some of it's kind of hand modeled. And that's just to create some some variation and, and teaching you different nodes. But for now, what I want to do is look at some procedural setups of built and that we're going to be building and that just to set decorate this building to give it a bit more detail. The first thing down here is I've got this little cables. And if I do the simple draw curve setup that I've implemented here, you can just click on here and drag and you get these little cables that run along the wall and you can see they've got little clips that you would almost nail them to the wall with and you can draw any shape you want obviously and they just kind of follow the surface then i've got another one which is a slightly more complex setup and this is like little sci-fi electric boxes and if i use the same method but not draw a long curve i'm just drawing little spots of curves and this is just for easy artistic placement, I wanted to use this curve type setup. And I can just drop a electric panel here. And maybe let's do another one here. Just so you can get an idea of what's going on. And like I said, I was talking about the procedural network and how you can change things randomly. So if you look at these, each one of these are totally different. Yeah, the appearance is the same, but the shape is different. The placement of everything, the little cables, everything's different. And this is controlled with all this data that I'm piping through the network. And I'm piping it into this panels, wall panel setup that I've created. And if I have a look at this wall panel setup inside, you can see there's a whole build of data of little pieces of geometry. Um, just going through one or two of them, I've got this component and, and I've got this one. So it's just little separate components and those are being built up together and essentially they've been put out into this little loop, which stamps them onto a, onto a grid and that grid, I can change sizes and I can change the variation on that grid to give me exactly what I want. And um, <clears throat> yeah, like I said, that is essentially what's happening. I've got a bunch of uh, different copies going on. And every time I paint a line, it creates a copy in that location and gives me the variation on it. Just gonna view this output again. And then just going to the side, another simple setup, I've got these pipes and this is again doing draw curves and these were really just like water pipes a kind of traveling water pipe i guess um, you can just again artistically place these but they've been procedurally built on the fly while you're actually placing them so i can again draw any shape i want and then lastly another one which is so exactly the same thing 
Uh, this time I've got little pipes that go into the ground. Two that don't, but most of them do. And what's interesting about this kind of setup is you can play with it in a sense that, well, I wanted I wanted to limit it so it's kind of at the ground level. And I built it so you could actually draw even all the way up here. And you'll see as I draw, they get placed at that same level. So they will always intersect with the ground. I can't really place them up here unless I build an override into the system. But for the purpose of this demo, I wanted to just keep them at this level. And I wanted to move on to another little setup that we'll be doing later on. And these are this is the communication towers. Let's just dive right in here and have a look at this. So we've got this little communication tower and essentially what's happening is there's a couple of models and they're almost getting stacked on top of each other. And let's just have a look at zooming in my notes. I've got all these little components. Let's zoom right in here so you can have a look at this. And yeah, we'll just skip through them, visualize them quickly. And then I'm joining them together with this special merge. And then I'm using this chain SOP that actually ships with Houdini. And that's really useful. What it's doing is essentially copying these objects to a line. So I've got this line here and I can just enable, if I enable this visualizer on it, I can change the length. And if I slide this up and down, now you can see my little tower is basically copying all those little things on top of each other and trying to maintain a, a shape and the actual scaling of it is controlled on here. So you can go down to the to the taper and you can actually change your, your scale of your objects on your tower and give more of an interesting kind of feel going on. And there's obviously, there's a couple of other things you can do. You can cycle through the parts. Uh, you can randomize it and do a seed value and those will random, randomly generate them in different locations, but they will still try and retain their spacing next to each other. And obviously you can create as many sort of uh, parts as you want. So. What's nice about this is going up the chain, back up the chain, I could modify any of these and it will update. Or I could even just take my little rubber toy and plug it in here and you could see instantly, I've got this little rubber toy and he's now living in that chain as well. Obviously he's not squared off, so, but you can see the top and the bottom is meeting. So, and he's scaling according to the scale of the setup here. And then if I don't want it, I just connect it again. And this setup is essentially the same as the little tubes or pipes that I was doing earlier on. It's using the same technique and although I'm obviously just using a straight line. So we could actually use a curve just to show you how easy this is. And let's plug this curve into the chain instead of my line. And let me start drawing on the viewport here. And you can immediately see now, wherever I draw, I've got that scale happening along that path. And all these objects are trying to align with the path. Um, just move this so we can see. Yeah, so moving it around. It's really cool just to quickly and dynamically create elements uh, like a mechanical snake. And then, yeah, I'm just gonna plug my line back in there. So we've got this back, delete this curve. And then just on the side, the same setup, what I'm doing is just the outer poles and little procedural connectors and let's merge them all together. And this is essentially one single pole that I'm copying. So you can see by just one line, they all adjust and and this top bracing bracket, this moves down as you go below a certain point. And this is just, yeah, having that level of control, I could add another point or two to it. And you can see, I can start creating 
tons of detail really quickly with this kind of setups. And lastly, the last two little setups I wanna look at is kind of a combined thing, but uh, it's using the procedurals type stuff as well. And this is with the terrain stuff. And for the terrains, we use what we call height fields. And let's just jump right in here. So I've got a bit of a setup. Let's just change this quick and zoom out. So this is my terrain with these kind of these little sand dune noise patches. And I've scaled this down just for this demo so we can have a better visualization of it. Um, so essentially we're using height fields and this is like a 2D volume, which we'll discuss a bit later on. I'm just gonna change its resolution a bit. And then I'm adding some various noise patterns to it as I go down the chain. And these are obviously the states is all being adjusted with as you go through the chain. So I've got it's distort and that's distorting the noise up. And I can disable the noise above it and you can see that disappears. And then we can move further on. I've got a whole bunch of little masks and patterns. And essentially it's creating these kind of little details that almost represent sand dunes kind of blown down on the one side and see the one side smooth and one side's rough. And then what we've got here is you can actually mask out areas. So an idea here is just to have a look at what I'm doing is I'm bringing in the building and I'm creating a mask on that height field. And essentially what I wanted to do was flatten out this area. So you can imagine if I just look at the, um, let's just merge this guy, merge these two quickly here and preview this. Now you can imagine this dune is kind of encroaching on this house here or this building. And at some points it's going too high up and it like it feels a little bit unnatural, like it's cutting through the building. And like, especially here by the garage door, you know, you don't want it to be high up there unless it was a really bad storm and there will be some piles of sand up. But for this demo, I wanted to keep it simple and show you what you would do is like just flatten out that area. So I've created that mask. And then what I can do is just create a flatten setup. And now you can see I've got everywhere the building is, the terrain is flat. And let's just clear this mask out so we don't visualize it. And there we go, you can see now we've got this terrain with this building in. And obviously being procedural, what we can do is I've got three different options here. We could just switch between those and go, okay, now I've got a, a torus in my scene and the grout, the terrain is flattening out around it. And I can move this torus around and you can see this just updates like super quickly. Um, as well as if I just go to the rubber toy and you can see that flattens out there. Let's go back to the torus and then other thing what you could do yeah you could just go right to your very first node and i could change the size of this and all my noises will propagate through the whole scene we can change maybe the height of the noise and we're still retaining all this information that we've built down below it's still saying exactly the same and let's move our little torus to the center and I'm going to move this down a little bit again, just to make it a bit more compact. What you can see is I can I can just make these changes so quickly once I've got a whole procedural system set up. And then lastly, I just want to move on to this little scattering objects along this, uh, which is just another example of procedural scattering. So I'm just going to switch. Let's just switch back to my building. And I'm going to go up out of here, and then I'm going to go into this little rock setup here. And immediately you can see I've brought it in. I've got my my rocks, little rocks, tiny little rocks. They're scattered all over the surface. I've got an extra noise here. I could just add extra noise into the terrain, and I can actually move this noise around. And you can see I've got these rocks that are scattered and essentially my little 
building area is still staying quite flat. I'm adding extra noise to the terrain. So just another interesting one. And then just going further down to the scatter, you can actually use the tool that does the scattering on two height fields. And you can just basically mess with the coverage. And you can see if I middle mouse to get this information, I've got 8,864 rocks in the scene. Um, and if I go into wireframe, for instance, you can see that it's a fairly decent resolution rock. Zoom out and I can push this a little bit further. And you can see I've got now quite a lot of rocks and that's yeah, 20, just over 21,000 rocks. But let's just reduce this again. And then what we could even do is just say we don't want those rocks in this input. We could just swap it out with another input. So yeah, I've got a rubber toy, a pig head, and a little head. And let's just plug that into this small rocks. And you can see now I've got those objects scattered along the surface in the same kind of place. And if I go into the wireframe again, you can see this is quite high res resolution geometry. And I'm not really struggling with any performance. I can go back and add a bit more. You'll see these blocks appearing. And these blocks are actually optimizations for the viewport. So you can see as I zoom in, they disappear. And this is just kind of culling based off the distance, viewing distance of our view like that from the side. You can get an idea. It's basically from the camera view backwards. This is just for the viewport. When you render, this won't look like this. So it's just simplifying the geometry to load a bit faster. But yeah, like I say, with this again, I can maybe change this up. I can say, well, I don't want it scattered everywhere. So I can actually switch this out and let's just do a height field paint. And I can actually paint on the surface where I want these objects as well as a lot of other techniques you could use, you could utilize some specific masking to height fields and you can really generate um, procedurally where you want this is a not as procedural system, but I just wanted to show you how quick and easy it was to scatter objects on a surface. And if you look at these objects, you can actually adjust the size of them. Uh, you can adjust the rotations so i'm going to randomize up so if i set it to zero if you look specifically at the heads for instance um, you can see if my randomizer is at naught they're sitting kind of aligned with the terrain and then if i offset it you can see they're offsetting and i can also set this all to zero and they will almost line up in a similar direction this is just randomizing each one so they're completely different on every randomize and it's going to zoom out here and plug my rocks back in. One just last little procedural setup I wanted to show you. I'm just going to plug my rocks back in here. And that was actually just how I generated these rocks. And let's go up to the top of this network. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm starting with a box. And let's just zoom in on this box. And then I'm using a Veroni Fracture. And this is what you would use generally to when we get into destruction and you're destroying buildings and this is great for a concrete breakup and it's basically building these little uh bits there's a whole bunch of bits in here that's broken up and you can visualize this by using this tool exploded view i'm just going to disable this node and let's look at this and now you can see i've got this box that's actually been exploded into this bunch of segments and they all like different shapes and it looks quite nice. So what other thing I did just to create the rocks, make them a little bit less uniform, to make them a bit longer. So I've actually stretched out the rocks a bit or the box a bit, and then that creates these kind of longer rock shards. Just feels a little bit more natural in shape. And then we've got this for each loop here. And this essentially what it's doing is it's taking each one of these objects into this loop network and operating on only one of them at a time. So if I click on this for each begin, 
you'll see now immediately there's only one object. And I'm doing a bunch of operations here, creating some noise. Um, so essentially giving it, converting it to a volume and a volume noise, and then I'm converting it back to mesh. And you can see now I've got this rock shape quite quickly with a, just a very few bunch of nodes. And then I'm center it in, centering it in the origin. And this is just for the scattering later on. It needs to be, all your objects need to be at the origin for it to scatter probably. And then, yeah, just adding some UV detail. And then what you can do is you just go to the end one and you can see now I've got a bunch of rocks and they're all overlapping. But what I can do is I can set this to single pass so we can actually look at individual ones. And you can see I cycle through each pass. So this is essentially this loop is set to do 10 passes. It says max maximum iterations. So it will only take 10 of these chunks out. So I'm only using 10 of these bits here that I've created. And I know there's around about 100 or so in this loop. I mean, I could use them all, but I, I found it unnecessary. So I just limited it to 10. But what I'm doing now is just showing you so sort of individual versions of that 10. And you can see I'm getting each shape has got a its own little rock. And because it's um, created in a slightly different location, the noise pattern is different. And the size is different because of that, the way it's been cut up. And then, yeah, just disable this and we'll have all our rocks on top of each other. These are all separate rocks on top of each other. So I can actually go to this explode view again down here. And now you can see the individual rocks in that exploded view. And then I've just piped that to given them some color. And then I'm piping that back into this scatter down here. And you can see now I've got my rocks scattered along the surface. Okay, that's all I wanted to show for this demo. I look forward to seeing you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the content. Please do head over to our fundamentals page over at rebelway.net and you can check out the course here. There should be a link down in the description. Uh, you can see the duration and kind of roughly the hours we're going to be covering on this course. There's a lot involved. It's quite a heavy one, but it's really geared towards the beginners and it's going to give you a good foundation to getting started into Houdini. So looking forward to this one. I really hope to see you there.